Good evening and uh, welcome all to the Institute for Government. Delighted you're all able to join us tonight for this seminar on uh, 50 ways to leave a coalition and how to govern in the final phase. Um, the Institute for Government is currently uh, conducting some research into this issue um, and we will be setting out some uh, recommendations for how Whitehall and the two coalition parties should approach the, the final year of their government um, in the new year. Um, and as part of that program of work, I'm delighted to welcome um, this excellent international panel. Um, thanks to all of you for joining us from across the EU, um, who I'll briefly introduce. Um, first to speak will be uh, Stan Carty, who's making his uh, third appearance at an IFG seminar, collecting for our loyalty uh, club, I think. Uh, Stan is a senior finance advisor to the Dutch Prime Minister and has seen uh, quite a number of coalitions come and go, I think it's fair to say, in The Hague. And he'll be talking about lessons from coalitions which both do and don't uh, make it through till the next scheduled election and what lessons we could learn from that. Um, next to speak um, is Noel Dempsey and welcome back also Noel, yes. you've spoken here before. Uh, Noel was a cabinet minister in a series of coalitions in Dublin, I think from 97 to 2011. Um, right, so has seen again quite a range of uh, different experiences of how coalitions end and also has seen in the most recent coalition a uh, government that hasn't made it till the end and fell apart amidst financial crisis. So interested to hear about that experience. Um, we'll then turn to uh, Stephanie Bodson, who is the UK correspondent of Die Welt and Welt am Sonntag. So we'll be speaking about recent German experience, where of course coalitions, the most two recent coalitions at least, have made it through the full four years, as most people seem to expect will happen here. Um, and then finally, welcome to Magnus Bolera from Sweden. Magnus is the uh, State Secretary uh, so the head of the Policy Coordination Secretariat for one of the four parties in the Swedish coalition. And, and what's interesting about Swedish government is they not only uh, have lasted the full term, but they in fact negotiate a joint electoral platform between the four coalition parties and then stand on that joint platform. So four different cases. And without further ado, I will ask Stan to kick off. Okay, is my microphone working? Well, you uh, understand me anyway. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the Institute for Government for inviting me again. Uh, due to the level of taxation in our country, we don't have any people left who can fund privately an institution like this. So uh, be very careful with it and enjoy it while you can. <laughs> Uh, but I'm very glad to, uh, to be back uh, here to tell something about Dutch coalitions. This is the order of my presentation, which will last around 10 minutes. In Holland, the electoral thresholds are very low, so that's why we have even a animal, the only animal rights party in the world uh, who don't uh, go for their voters, but actually only, uh, in their only interest is animal rights. They have two seats in parliament. And just to give you an uh, idea how scattered our parliament uh, is. Um, my job is basically to make sure that whenever politicians making whatever negotiations on whatever agreement, that they get uh, the right numbers, the right uh, info, so that their agreement can actually uh, come into reality. That's basically my job. I'm a civil servant. I'm not a political appointee. Uh, I do have, of course, my own private political affiliation, but it has nothing to do with my job. I have been uh, uh, instated by a Christian Democrat Prime Minister. I now work for a Liberal Prime Minister, and I will uh, try to work some more. I do, I'm doing this work for uh, five years uh, uh, now. So it's very different from how things work here in uh, Britain, where every new Prime Minister takes in 200, 300 uh, people in Downing Street and they start fighting with the departments. I will talk about that later. Um, we used to be pretty stable in the Netherlands, uh, but the last 10 years we have very, we've had very many unstable cabinets. You see here in red and, red and green 
uh, how, it, how it went with different cabinets. Still, the government itself went on pretty smoothly, I should say, as being a civil servant, I think. And I, I, I didn't know where to start because each start, uh, wh which year I start, it, it always gives you um, statistical uh, uh, changes. Uh, so it was very difficult for me to say, well, is the Netherlands stable or not? The last 10 years, the cabinets are very unstable, but still, during the reign of Queen Beatrix, who just resigned, uh, we have only had five prime ministers. So uh, I'm not sure if the, in, in 33 years. So you decide yourself if it's stable or unstable. Um, our civil service is really organized to face up to uh, coalition politics because it's the way it's, it's working in our, in our country. And three years ago, I was invited here to talk to you about how, how does coalition work, a coalition government actually work, because it was new to you and you were very much afraid that there would be no single line of command anymore. And what would happen if there was a minister from, a secretary of state from one party and a, and a minister from another party? Well, three years later, uh, it still works uh, here that way. I said, then I said to you, it's, it's only, the, the main thing of coalition government is it takes more time because you need to talk to the different parties more. Maybe politics, pol policies are also more balanced because it's more, uh, because you talk more, so you get the edgy things, you get them out. And also politics, po uh, policies may also be maybe too balanced, which would be a minus because um, I I if no one recognizes the policy anymore, if you only have compromises, it's very difficult for voters to see whatever uh, happened. So, and still, uh, the inv invitation for this um, uh, seminar still gives me the sign that you're still worried about coalition government. How are we going to take, uh, how are we going to survive that last year? Well, the Dutch advice to you <laughs> is uh, keep calm and carry on. And I'm going to split my presentation in two uh, different areas. First, the regular endings of coalitions. How does it work in the Netherlands? And secondly, the irregular endings of coalitions. Um, our experience is the last year there won't be any new policy initiatives, except nice ones, tax cuts, you know what. But my question to you is, if you be fair, is it really difficult, different from one party government? I leave the answer to you. All eyes at the, at the coming election, eh? so politicians, they need to have some breathing space, they need to represent themselves to the voters. They, they, the Liberal Democrats and the Conservative uh, ministers, they don't go here from door to door and say, well, we've had such a nice coalition, please, I don't care if you vote conser the Liberal Democrat, he will say, vote Liberal Democrat. He won't say, I don't care if you vote Conservative or Liberal Democrat, because we worked so well together, uh, the last coalition, he will say, vote Liberal Democrat. So he needs, in the last year, ministers need to have some breathing space. That's what we do, what we accept in the Netherlands in the last year of a coalition. You see that ministers take more uh, personal freedom in expressing their views on policies and, and people understand. And it's no thing, it's not a big thing. It's not that the ministry will fall apart. It's just a, a political view. Um, what do we do actually as a civil service when there is a regular ending uh, coming up? We make one year before the elections, we make sure there are fundamental spending reviews on all uh, big uh, policy areas. We prepare in, an imp in a politically impartial way. We prepare documents for the politicians, for all political parties, governmental or opposition. Uh, we give them uh, information about how to make cutbacks or sometimes also how if you want to spend more money, where, should you, where could you use it? And uh, sometimes we do, uh, in 2010, because of the big crisis uh, from 2009, we did it in, for all the policy areas of, uh, of the government, but normally we do it for several um, uh, policy areas uh, each year. Six months before, and that's really something I think it's only happening in the Netherlands, we have the, budget, uh, the report by the Budgetary Framework Commission. That's an, uh, it consists of 10 senior civil servants from Treasury, Dutch Central Bank, Central Planning Agency, Trade Department, Social Security Department. And they make an uh, advice for the next government about the financial position of the government. Should there be cutbacks? Uh, uh, what should we do with interests? Uh, whatever. 
Uh, it's, it's from civil servants. It's, of course, the content is highly political, but the cabinet agrees to give this report without any comment to parliament, to all uh, political parties. And it's highly influ influential, and basically it's the start for any election program, any election manifesto always starts with, well, uh, according to the Budgetary Framework Commission, we need to make cutbacks for 20, mil 20 billion euros. And then <laughs> political parties, they start to explain why they agree to the 20, million, 20 billion, I'm sorry, or why they actually differ from it. So the political parties really um, are forced to react on this uh, issue. And it really forces political parties also to make their election manifesto more rational and more, uh, I mean, they can't do promises uh, which, they, which are really only fantasy. Then the Treasury, three months before, makes uh, information on all the budgets, all the different budgets uh, where there is slack or where you could take some money. And they, they also do it in an unpolitical way. So they make cutbacks or tax rises which would be acceptable for left-wing parties, but also for right-wing parties. So the, you try to, uh, to guess a little bit what, what these parties would like, and the Treasury makes these lists. And all the, the party leaders, they visit the civil service, actually, in the Treasury, not the minister, but the civil service, and they discuss whatever is possible for their election manifesto. And then the most important one is the ex ante appreciations of the election manifestos. Election manifestos are more or less published uh, in the Netherlands around two, two and a half months before the election. And then our central planning agency, they, they start to make calculations of it. So they make, um, they make clear which election manifesto gives the most jobs in the long, in the long term, the most jobs in the short term, which, manifest, which political party in this manifesto makes the best cutbacks in finance, or which manifesto does the best for education. So actually you get an independent um, uh, report on, on which political parties do what? Well, of course, this is highly political stuff. You can imagine that. Uh, whenever I talk to politicians from other countries, they don't understand that politicians in the Netherlands actually let themselves be, uh, uh, be taken by the central budget office, uh, the central planning agency, I'm sorry, to do this. But still, it's highly influential. The pr presentation is live on television. In, it's, it's a big thing in the Netherlands. And, um, uh, and then, of course, then, Afterwards, the fighting starts, and you know, one party says, well, we are the champion in, in job creation. Another party says, no, but education, it's the savers with us. And, but then voters really can see if they uh, like one or another. It's, it's not really something, it's not that if one party says it's 40,000 jobs and I have only 38,000 jobs, but it's still, it's something you can compare parties with. It's very influential. So, but this is what we basically do, the civil service, if there is a regular ending, we have a, uh, uh, this, our work, how we prepare. Now, the irregular endings of coalitions, early breakups. Um, well, lots of leaks, mostly correct in the newspapers. That's probably a sign that things are not going well. Mm -hmm. Continuing bad opinion polls for just one coalition partner is also very uh, likely to uh, speed up the ending of coalitions. Well, uh, civil servants, they can never stop it. So whatever you think, if you should, whatever you should do this last year to keep the government together, if they don't want it, whatever you do, it's not going to help you. It's not going to help. And um, luckily, in our country, the last six years, Dutch voters never have ever rewarded parties who ended up a coalition, who, ended, who went out of the coalition. They were always, in the next election, thrashed by the... Uh, Voters. And still, I don't know why they still try it, <laughs> but uh, sometimes they still do. Okay, so conclusions. If a coalition does reach this last year, I would advise you, don't push ministers for reforms anymore, they're just not going to do it. It's only natural. They need, uh, they need time for their elections, it's part of their work, you should understand that. If you were, were yourself a politician, you would do the same. Politicians will probably tempor temporarily stop thinking strategically. Is there any politician in the room? <laughs> so make sure you do. That's what I said about the preparing your interdepartmental dossiers, get your um, uh, fundamental spending reviews uh, right, uh, etc. Start preparing for the next government. Don't focus on the current government only. Uh, so 
make sure you have, whenever uh, political parties want information for their election manifesto, make sure you have it ready for them. And basically, and finally, make sure you act impartial. So make sure that whatever information you make, it's available for all parties. Because otherwise, if the civil service gets in between the wheels of party politics, it's a bad thing. Then what can you do if a coalition falls early? Uh, there's not much you can do except being able to organize an election quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, but try to use the available time as, uh, to update information. So what we do is we make a shortened report on the Framework Commission. So again, we still, even though we have only a few weeks, we still give them an advice where, for, uh, where to start their election manifesto. Um, and of course, you have less time, so you can do less, but still make sure that political parties get for their election manifestos, they get the information they do not automatically have. Political parties' ideas, they have enough, but they always lack information about how much it costs, how many cutbacks is necessary, is it legally possible, etc. So make sure you have it available for political parties to help them writing their manifesto. Okay, this is ba basically what we do, how we do it in the Netherlands. Um, I leave you with one uh, final quote, which is my own uh, favorite series and which you should all look to if you need any wisdom uh, in your last year in coalition. And I would thank you for your attention. Well, Stan, thanks very much. Um, Noel, I heard a couple of sort of <laughs> chuckles of recognition at some of that. So very much look forward to what you have to say now. Thank you very much, and i um, delighted to be back with you. Um, the first time I addressed uh, this kind of a gathering here, I know, noted that there was a lot of trepidation about coalitions, and uh, I could identify with that because for um, the first 50 years of um, our existence as a state, we had three coalitions which lasted about three years each. Uh, since the uh, early 80s, we've had 10 coalitions, and it looks like we will continually uh, have coalition governments into the future. Um, I um, listened very carefully to what Stan was saying, and he talked about politicians uh, stopping to think strategically as it gets near an election. I, I beg to differ with him. They uh, do think very strategically running up to an election, but only from an electoral point of view, <laughs> not, <laughs> not from any other. Um, just, I, I'm going to speak about this uh, in the 10 minutes um, uh, from a political point of view, and now having the benefit of being out of the political system, I probably can see things a little bit more clearly than I could when I was in the middle of it. Um, one of the questions that was posed to, to me in relation to this and that we were all uh, asked to address was what are the challenges facing coalitions in governing right up until the next election. And I suppose the biggest challenge at this phase of government is very simple, uh, very simply, electoral nerves. Um, they're suffered by all politicians at all times. The minute one election is over, they start thinking about the next one. And uh, obviously, when you're just going into government, the electoral nerves are very calm and soothed. Uh, but as you get closer to the end of an electoral cycle, they start getting very, very nervous uh, again. And in the last 12 months, I think that electoral nerves becomes electoral paranoia. Uh, and that is the big danger, for not just for a coalition. Um, I was in a single party uh, government as well, and the same thing happens. Everybody gets very, very nervous, and I would agree with Stan that uh, in the last uh, 12 months of an election, or uh, the run into an election, don't expect uh, that kind of strategic thinking in relation to budgetary matters, policy, or anything else, except perhaps in the back rooms of the parties where they're devising the manifesto to put to the people uh, in the next general election. Th that paranoia or nervousness um, intensifies, I think it's fair to say, uh, in a coalition government because both parties, while they want to continue to govern, uh, they don't want to give their partners uh, in government any electoral advantages which can be used in the election campaign. And that 
at its worst um, can, can lead again to this type of paranoia. It can lead to legislative and policy development paralysis uh, for government. Um, and I don't think um, any country is different or any political party is different. Uh, you don't um, come out with brand new innovative policies except perhaps tax cuts or whatever else it is in the 12 months before you expect to have a general election. It's, it's not good policy from any point of view. One of the best ways of counteracting in a coalition, counteracting the nerves, counteracting the difficulties that might arise is sticking to the programme for government. Um, it, it, it's still, there are still large parts of it usually uh, that have to be finished, that have to be obligations and commitments that have to be met. It was a blueprint when you started out as coalition, as a coalition government. You agreed it um, in the cold light of a distance away from an election campaign. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it was a good idea. Both parties felt uh, there were good ideas, good policies and so on. And with the exception of things that have happened that may have thrown the uh, particular commitments off course, it's a good idea to keep this uh, blueprint and uh, it lessens the chances of increased paranoia and tension between parties if you're sticking to something that has been agreed in the past. The big problem for the parties themselves um, is that there's an increased pressure uh, from their own members and supporters to highlight the particular achievements that they've had in government, the policies that they've been implemented. Supporters, quite rightly, want to be in a position to be able to go out to their own members, to the electorate generally, and say, look, this was our policy the last time round, and we have implemented it, um, to uh, maintain their credibility with their supporters. And obviously, MPs will try at all times um, to emphasise those particular party successes to motivate their constituency workers for the next election as well. So it's inevitable in the run-up to an election that the partners in a, in a coalition who have inevitably and have largely supported one another uh, over the previous few years will slowly revert to being rivals. And as I say, that is understandable but it's something that has to be managed, managed by party leaderships, managed by the headquarters of the various parties, or it can lead uh, to a, a disintegration of trust between the parties with uh, very, very negative uh, consequences for both parties in government. As I say, it's perfectly natural and acceptable for each party to point out their successes in government. Uh, in fact, it's probably healthy for uh, for them and, and indeed just uh, for politics generally, that they can point to successes. Uh, but all of that should be tempered by an acknowledgement of the role that the partners in government have played and it shouldn't ever be used as a form of one-upmanship um, between the parties and partners in government. Um, one of the things that I said uh, when I, uh, at, the, at the previous seminar, just after the coalition forming was that a key requirement of um, in the life of a coalo coalition government is effective, clear and timely communication. And um, that becomes even more important um, at, at this time in the life of a, a government. As I said, members, even ministers will be highlighting um, their own successes or their party successes or the party policies that have got, got through um, over the previous three or four years. And um, if that gets totally out of control, it can result in disjointed government. So it is important that the communications between party leaders and between parties are maintained and um, that the successes of government are highlighted and uh, are shared by government. Uh, I think the direct lines here in the UK between Mr Cameron and Mr Clegg have to be kept open no matter what the difficulties are. Um, if that fails, then uh, even at this stage of the lifetime of a government, it can have devastating effects in the relationship between the parties and on the government itself. 
um, civil servants were mentioned. I'm not going to stray too far into that because Dan has dealt with it, but I, I do think that civil servants have a key role to play here. Um, I found in coalition governments between parties, even where there's a lot of respect on both sides among the politicians, again, as you get closer to an election, you revert to party, party positions, you, you start defending party positions, uh, you tend uh, perhaps not to be as clear-sighted about the importance of a policy issue for your colleagues in government. And I believe that civil servants um, with a good ability to read what is vitally important to, to one party uh, and the, the means and lines of communications to be able to communicate that to the other party where issues arise is extremely important. I'm not advocating civil servants uh, get caught between the political parties, but I think um, it, it is important uh, that sometimes that outside view uh, where a civil servant a non in a non-partisan way can quietly point out this is of crucial importance, don't underestimate the importance of this to uh, the one or other of the parties, it can be hugely important. Um, <clears throat> I just go back as well to the program for government. The most effective way to approach and resolve disputes is reference back to the uh, program for government. Um, if you have a commitment there, no matter how inconvenient it is at this stage, you should stick with that. Um, I'm, don't want to get too involved in uh, politics in the UK at the moment. It was long enough at it in Ireland. But uh, it just, from a distance, it appears that the most recent dispute or argument that's going on in the government uh, in relation to energy policy might be a, a good thing to, to highlight what I'm talking about. The programme for government uh, does seem to lean uh, in the direction largely of the Lib Dems and a greener agenda. I notice um, Mr Cameron is quoted as saying uh, in the recent past that we need to move away from that. Now this is unattributed and it's a leak that we mentioned earlier on Stan I think. Um, but I think um, Moving away from a commitment that's there in the programme for government can cause the problems. I think the way that politicians should handle that if they want to differentiate themselves is uh, to start producing their policy documents for the next general election and uh, let uh, people make their judgments on where they're going to go from now. They've already committed for this particular uh, government. Just, um, I make the general point that both parties have every right to claim credit for policy successes, uh, and that should be facilitated in the maximum, to the ma maximum extent possible. It'll obviously help both parties with their supporters and with the ride, wider electorate. The big danger, as I say, is that that leads uh, to a rivalry, it leads to a breakdown in communication, it leads to uh, the coalition government falling or breaking up in acrimony. And um, I think that uh, I've been involved in a number of government uh, governments, and I'd agree with Stan's lesson there, when, government, when governments, coalition governments, break up in acrimony or in a row, both parties generally suffer. One will suffer more than the other, whoever was seen to be the bully, and that's usually the larger party uh, that gets that. But neither party really benefits uh, from an acrimonious uh, breakup. So it is Im an important lesson, I think. Um, the governments that we had in Ireland, um, uh, I've, I was part of five coalitions over the almost 20 years in government. I witnessed a sixth from opposition. Three ended prematurely and in acrimony, and three went the full course. Um, the three that survived, strangely enough, uh, and went the full term were the ones that would have been given the least chance of surviving at the outset. The third um, coalition was definitely one that was seen that would not work because it 
uh, contain politicians from the right, right to the, what passes as the extreme left in Ireland at the time, but it did uh, survive and had a common platform in the next election. Um, the ones that ended in acrimony, again, um, uh, emphasised for me the importance of trust between the two leaders and between the two parties. Uh, two of them uh, fell because of a breakdown in trust between the leaders of the parties. Um, and these things don't happen by accident. Um, I think they can, um, they can actually uh, be avoided. The last government in Ireland, and I was asked to speak specifically about this, and I'll, I'll finish with it, um, uh, was uh, Fianna Fáil, who had um, the largest number of seats, the dominant party in, in, in Ireland for 80 years, with 78 seats in this parliament, six seats with the Greens and a number of in independents. Um, the relationship in government wasn't an easy one from the start, but um, because they were so different, I, I suppose, for in, in political outlook, but um, the negotiation for government gave us uh, built up personal relationships but the breakdown of that particular government can be said to have been because of the inherent instability and lack of lack of experience of government of the smaller green party i would say that wouldn't i and uh, the unprecedented external economic pressures faced by the irish government over the the two years two and a half years that that government was in place it's not really a very uh, typical breakup of a coalition government um, because the pressures that came about came about externally even more so than internally but if people want to ask me specific questions about that they can they can do so one final point in conclusion um, there, I I was very opposed to the first coalition that we entered um, I believed it was an in, inherently uh, an unstable form of government uh, that's going back to the, the mid 80s um, but uh, having experienced them over the years, uh, there's absolutely no inherent reason why a coalition should be any less stable or effective than a single party government as it heads to an election or indeed at any other time. The effectiveness of the government will be decided by the maturity of the two party leaders and the parties themselves and the shared commitment that they have to delivering on a programme for government. Thank you. Well, yeah, thanks very much, Noel, for that fascinating uh, talk. And Stefan? Yeah, there's a bit of peer pressure to stand up, so <laughs> no also. I actually plan to sit down, but anyway. Um, it's, it's actually very timely to talk about coalitions in Germany. We were just saying that because yesterday morning there was uh, finally an agreement in Berlin. There's the third grand coalition to be formed in Germany, uh, which, as you might know, will depend on a ballot of the membership of the SPD in the next, until the 14th of December, which is to be seen whether the uh, members of the SPD will really endorse uh, this coalition treaty. But as the headlines say, Merkel has moved pretty much to the left, so chances are good that the SPD membership will say yes. Um, of course, you might expect uh, German politics to be very matter of fact, very efficient, without any emotions. Now that's completely <laughs> wrong. Um, not too long ago, the, uh, the last coalition, which were liberals and Christian Democrats, they would publicly um, call each other um, a bunch of losers and a horde of wild boars. Uh, while the Rose Garden might seem a distant memory, even the coalition here in the UK, I think, will not get to such low levels. Um, but one thing is absolutely true. Coalitions are in the bloodstream of German politics and not only since 1945. Um, the post-war post period cemented coalition as a mainstay principle of German government. Only once there has been a single party government, and that was in the end of the 50s, 1960, when uh, a small party merged with the Adenauer's CDU at the time. So why is this such, a, yeah, such so much in the bloodstream? Um, of course, it's due to the proportional electoral system that we got. Um, but there are also other factors. Because of the federal system, there's always the risk of having an opposition in the Bundesrat, which is like the second chamber. Um, and this is one more reason why Merkel in the last days and weeks so 
uh, was so uh, exhaustingly engaged into coalition talks because otherwise if she had not formed a coalition with the SPD, the SPD currently has a majority in the Senate and then Germany would have been completely paralyzed. I'm also coming back to Merkel in a minute because I think you can't talk about German coalition politics if you don't talk about Merkel. <coughs> Well, there's always a lot of talk about the imminent threat of the coalition breaking down because that's a great headline. You have it here in this country um, so often and in Germany you also have it very often and the media loves it. Um, but of the 17 coalition govern governments in Germany, since 1945 only one broke down. Um, that was beginning of the 80s when the Liberals left the coalition with the SPD and then um, Helmut Kohl won the elections and we had 16 beautiful years of <laughs> CDU and that was the happy times before uh, the reunification. Um, <clears throat> but still, of course, there are lots of tensions and a lot of conflic conflicts and sometimes also very deep ones, but still, in general, coalitions in Germany stay the course. Because, and this is what, my, what the panel said before, the, the um, electoral risk for both parties is too high. You can see it immediately if there are there was actually the last coalition was quite, quite a disaster and they were constantly either in rows with, with each other or within the party and their polls would just go down. The parties, not Merkel. Merkel stayed always on top but the, 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 um, the parties really suffered because of constant rows in their coalition and within their parties. So German voters quickly punish parties that so obviously put their own interests above the national responsibility. Opposition is missed. Opposition is crap. <laughs> Franz Müntefering, the former SPD's um, general secretary, once famously said, well, politicians want power and that's why they are where they are. But in recent years, what we have seen is that power for the junior partner has been almost as crap as opposition. <laughs> the smaller party in a coalition runs the risk of paying a very high price for their share of power. At least this was the case in the two last mandates, the last two coalitions in Germany, so since 2009, sorry, 2005 to 2009 we had the Grand Coalition and then 2009 to 2013 uh, the CDU and the FDP. <clears throat> so in 2009 the SPD sunk to its worst result ever and still has not recovered really. And only two months ago the FDP, the good old FDP, the German Liberals, were thrown out of the Bundestag. We have this 5% threshold in Germany and they only got 4.9%. And so after 64 years in the Bundestag and 46 years in government, they were kicked out of the Bundestag. Um, and they have been 46 years, that tells you already that actually the Liberals were always the matching partner, mostly for the CDU, but also sometimes for the Social Democrats. So what happened in both cases, what remained with the voters was that these parties did not stand up for their policies and principles for which they were actually voted for. And supporters of the SPD in, the, in that case were angry because, among other things, the party agreed in, I think in 2005 already, to rise the pension age to 67. And the Liberals lost credibility mainly because they failed to deliver their one and only uh, promise, which were tax cuts. There's another factor which is important looking at coalitions in Germany recently, and this is that the political landscape has become so much more dynamic. So in the 80s we had the Greens, uh, which joined the um, coalition with the SPD in 1998. Then after reunification, of course, the Linkspartei, uh, the Pirate Party, which was kind of a phenomena, but they were still around, especially in 2010-11, they won some Länder elections. And then most recently the Alternative für Deutschland, which is more or less a single issue party, but they were... Um, well, what, what, their, what their program is, is to, that they want Germany to leave the euro. And they were only founded in April this year, and in September, in the elections, they got 4.5%. So that's a huge thing, and they mainly got votes away from the FDP. So <clears throat> looking at this, um, obviously the pressure on parties is, has become so much bigger. And it seems like the electorate is, is conscious of that, because um, before... Merkel, uh, the CDU, talked uh, first to the SPD and then they talked to the Greens. And when they were talking to the Greens about talking about a coalition, there was a poll and 48% of the Germans said that they thought the Greens should not join a coalition with, um, with the CDU because they would come out harmed. 
They could, they could not be in a coalition and keep their, keep their spirit. And this, this brings me, of course, to talk a little bit about, about Merkel. And I think many people in this country are intrigued by her. Uh, she's been described as the black widow of German politics and the politician who kills all the alpha males around her. Um, she, she seems to be the politician who's absolutely immune to um, this ever more political, uh, political competition. Whatever is true, but she definitely has changed the game. And maybe because she does not really have a program, she doesn't really have a strategy or a vision, but she's very flexible and very adaptable. And be it the nuclear issue, which always was a green issue, or be it um, minimum wage, if necessary, she changed the politics and then the parties who stood for these policies actually had lost them. So she has risen above the mere job of a chancellor and for years now has achieved an almost presidential status. So for her, coalition partners come and go. And so the eve of the last coalition between liberals and Christian Democrats got pretty nasty. Um, they stayed, of course, together until the end because you do that in German politics if you can, not like in the Netherlands, but um, when, when it was maybe in mid-September, the polls for the FDP were so bad that uh, their, um, the head of the FDP went out and said, you need to give us the second vote, so then you keep Merkel. And immediately the CDU sent out five million letters and said, give us both votes. And Merkel came out and said, if you want Merkel, vote CDU. So it was obvious she, she just wanted to stay where she was with whoever. So not with whoever, of course, but um, so we, we've now in fact seen yesterday morning um, the formation probably of the 18th coalition government in Germany. And though CDU and SPD are no natural allies, I think there are good chances they will stay for four years. And for all Britain's recent appetite for coalitions, it's difficult to imagine that David Cameron will invite Ed Miliband to the Rose Garden. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, thanks, thanks very much for that, uh, as you said, very topical discourse on German government. And now Magnus. Yeah. Thank you so much, Akash. Uh, and thank you so much for inviting me to this uh, seminar. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Uh, I will start with, with uh, like Stephanie, some uh, with the national stereotype, uh, this time about Sweden. Uh, Sweden has its image of uh, a land of careful consultation and consensus. And it's uh, even Lenin, um, back in the days, said that if there was a revolution in Sweden at breakfast time, by midday, all sides would have been lunch together, having lunch <laughs> together. Uh, and maybe this is true, but uh, when it comes to, we may be a country uh, known for consensus, but uh, we are definitely not a country of coalitions. Uh, so I will have to start there, because even if we have seven to eight uh, parties in parliament, and with two main rivals, social democrats to the left, and moderates to the right, we are not used to coalition governments at all. Most of the 20th century uh, for Sweden was the history of one party rule. There was a total hegemony of the Social Democrats. Uh, Margaret Thatcher may have wanted to go on and on, but one Social Democratic Prime Minister, Tage Erlander, served for 23 years in a row before being followed by Olof Palme for another six years. So apart from nine years, the Social Democrats has governed Sweden pretty much constantly from 1932 to 2006. Even in the minority government, the Social Democrats never offered ministerial posts to another party in parliament. So uh, our elections were quite like a uh, famous quote from Gary Lineker, then about football. <laughs> Uh, football is an odd game, uh, two teams kicking a ball around for 90 minutes and then the Germans win. <laughs> and that was pretty much the same uh, for Swedish elections as well, always ending up with the Social Democrats in power. Uh, and we have only two periods uh, when this, where the centre-right 
coalition governments, only two governments after the war, 1976 to 1982, and 91 to 94. And um, they were not uh, very good advertisements for the parties or the voters of coalition governments. Between 26 and 82, we had four center-right coalition governments in six years. Uh, that was an Italian phase of Swedish politics. Then in 1991, uh, it was for a Greek phase. Uh, we had a deficit as large as Greek, Greece. Yes. And we had a central bank base rate reached 500%. And the incoming four-party coalition was a classic forced marriage coalition based on a single newspaper article written by two of the four parties. So the start wasn't that good, and the end wasn't better. Uh, the party leader from the Centre Party, which I represent, Olaf Johansson, left the government three months before the general election over the building of a bridge to Denmark. Whilst leaving the party still inside government, the party leader left, the party stayed. Uh, amongst 50 ways of leaving a coalition, <laughs> this must indeed be one of the most odd ones. <laughs> but that was history. Up until 2006, when a former coalition of the four centre-right parties, the Alliance, stood in the general election and won, and we won again in 2010, twice in a row. And I believe that we have finally learned, as Churchill have said, those who fail to learn from the lessons of history are condemned to repeat them. And what have we learned? We have learned that you need to compromise, that you need to prepare to be able to, to govern. So we formed in 2004, two, ta two years before the election we created the alliance. Four different parties created the alliance. We created, we formed a common pact and platform for a common direction. We had both a common manifesto, but also uh, indiv individual party manifestos as well. Uh, and we had a pre-election deal in 2006. We made a new one before the elections in 2010. And we are now in the beginning of the process of creating a common manifesto for the general elections in September 2014. So we have the mandate for, from our party members to, to go to the voters for a third, asking for a third term as the alliance. So, how are we in a way prepared to do this, uh, and what lessons have we learned? Yeah, the only way to, to, to rule out the social democratic hegemony was to start cooperating. Otherwise, we have tried this to cannibalize on each other. It wasn't a way of success. So we started to cooperate, and uh, some lessons that we learned uh, from the past uh, uh, will form the basis for this cooperation now. You really need, as uh, Noel mentioned, you need a strong commitment and a strong trust between the leaders. We have created what we can call a willing marriage. You really need a serious preparation. We started two years before the elections, and we are definitely doing preparation in, on a, in an intensive way now, uh, more than a year uh, before the elections in September. You need a strong and ongoing involvement of the MPs and the party members. You need to anchor agreements from the top and down. And fourth, you need really strong internal processes inside the government for decision making, where we fight behind closed doors and unite externally. This is the lessons we have 
learned from our history. So just coming up to the end game thing. Well, this formation of the alliance has changed much of the discussion in Sweden. Uh, we are not, no one expects us to fall before the elections. There is no ending discussion. So we have created a new political reality. The old sole natural party of government, the Social Democrats, they are, no, they are now facing a constant media demand about what alliance they will form to govern. The problem from the center, of the center-right side that we are not trusted, we are not, they don't think we were fit to govern. This has turned to the, opposite, to the opposition and uh, the Social Democrats are now facing the same questions. But what will happen uh, when we're coming up right up until the election? Well, uh, every, even in Sweden, of course, the, tray may, the train may slow down when you come close to the, to the station, of course. We are, for example, not allowed to present government bills after Easter this year, next year. Uh, so there is a natural way of slowing down, but that is not a sign of uh, tiredness. It's uh, not a loss of momentum. It's a natural thing, which has been explained previously by, by Stan and Noah. You need to change the focus from government work to, to uh, meet the voters uh, and campaigning. But still, we have this uh, joint decision-making mechanism running all, all the time. And that's, that is um, what I'm doing uh, at uh, the, the Policy <laughs> Coordination Secretariat in the Prime Minister's office. And we have uh, two guiding disciplines working together, uh, laid down by the uh, party leaders. Uh, one is uh, that you that we should all contribute, so we should all win and gain. And the other guiding principle is that we, we do not seek the lowest common denominator, which is not the way of ruling, uh, governing a country. So in the end phase, I think you, you can follow the, the recommendations from, from Stan. Keep calm and carry on. That's a good one. But the train may slow down, but don't jump off. <laughs> if you are a driver, either you, you will hurt yourself, you will be punished by the electorate, you will get lost, uh, or do you risk the entire train to stop? How do we handle government unity? I will end up with this, because that is quite an important one. And the formation of the alliance has created a major shift, the shift of the mindset of the voters. A huge group of center-right voters now identify themselves as alliance voters primarily. They are alliance voters. And then they make the second choice, which of the parties inside the alliance are you going to vote for. for. And that is, we have succeeded in establishing a way of looking at the alliance that we are greater than the sum of, the, of, of our parties. We can add value to the alliance. For the center party, it's the environment, for the moderates, it's the economy. For the liberals, it's the education. And for the Christian Democrats, it's family, family business. So we are, in a way, even our own members of the parties prefer a coalition government before, or in, uh, it's better with a coalition government than one party government. And we have. stopped infighting. And um, 
the voters are the one creating the situation for coalitions. And uh, we strongly believe that only the fittest to govern will survive. Thank you. Thanks, Magnus. Well, we've had uh, four very different and I think uh, all equally fascinating presentations. We've had quotes from uh, Sir Humphrey, Lenin and Gary Lineker. <laughs> I wasn't expecting one of those. Um, and I'll now open up to questions from the floor. And do, do remember, I should have mentioned before, this is all um, on the record, so <laughs> be careful what you say. Uh, yes, and there's a microphone coming. It's time to say now. Thank you. My, 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 my name's John Newham. I'm a teacher of politics. And a couple of points in the British context. What is the significance of the fact that the current government is tied into the, you know, into the fixed term? I mean, I know not completely in the American sense, but the assumption is that they'll go right down to the, down to the end in, in May. And also, but at least in public, both the Conservative Party and the Labour Party seem to be behaving as if, oh, this is a mere aberration, they're going to win overall. I suspect that privately there's an awful lot going on. Uh, could you comment, please? Yeah. Okay, well, if there are another question or two, I'll take them as a group. Anyone gather their thoughts yet? Yes, there. It was interesting to hear about Sweden and how you've got the alliance of centre-right parties. Do you think that parties in the centre between the major centre-right and the major centre-left tend to form a red alliance or a blue alliance or do you ever see um, a party that goes one day with a social democratic party and then one day with a centre-right party and do you think that's possible for the context of the Liberal Democrats could they be trusted to go with Labour? Mm -hmm. Okay and yeah we'll take one final yeah. question here then please uh, there's a microphone coming. Uh, there you go. Sorry Dick Leonard I'm a uh, a journalist and uh, in fact spent 30 years as a foreign correspondent in Brussels where I experienced 12 uh, different coalitions of every uh, conceivable uh, permutation. Uh, so if I have any uh, uh, qualification for taking part in the debate, I, I think it rests on my experience in Belgium. The um, mm. question I'd like to ask uh, really concerns the formation of the coalitions rather than their, uh, their dissolution. Uh, what do parties in your respective countries say when they're asked during the election campaign, if they haven't fixed up an arrangement for hand, as to their preference uh, to, uh, for coalition uh, partners. My experience, not only in Belgium, from uh, other countries, if, if they say anything at all, and there's no uh, requirement for them to do so, that they say they would prefer uh, to go in with parties whose policy uh, position was nearest to theirs. Now, the last election in uh, Britain, uh, Nick, uh, Nick Clegg was asked this question, and again, what I regard as a very idiosyncratic answer. What he said was that he would uh, discuss first uh, with the party uh, which got uh, the most uh, votes or, or, or the most, uh, most uh, seats. Uh, I suspect uh, that this was because he had a strong personal preference uh, to go in with the Tories, but had doubts as to whether his allegedly left or centre party uh, would. Uh, would uh, uh, follow this, and in fact, uh, having done this, it made it easier, I think, for him to negotiate with the Tories, where, uh, from my uh, viewpoint, he negotiated an extremely bad deal, a uh, patently bad deal, for his own party. But I should declare an interest, because many years ago, I used to be a Labour MP. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks very much. So, yeah, so there's a question about the um, significance of having a fixed term. Uh, which I think would be a good one for <laughs> um, either of the speakers to the right to, to tackle. And then there was also the question directed at you, Magnus. Yeah. But maybe there's a general point there about parties which try to form coalitions on one side or the other, and whether, or on both <coughs> sides, and whether that's a good strategy. And then linked to that question, um, there was this issue of parties saying before the election uh, who their preferred partners should be and what kind of tactics work in that respect. Um, so, uh, Magnus, do you want to maybe pick up on a couple well, of Well, like, thank you for interesting questions, and I have, hope you help me with uh, remember the questions as well. Uh, but start with the fixed period. We have, uh, Sweden have a fixed period. The J is in the constitutional law, the second Sunday of September. So, so re it's really fixed. <laughs> 
you need to change the constitution to, to change the day of vote. So, so yeah, it, I think it's, it matters. We, we really know from the beginning that we, are, have, we have four years and we will end together in September. That's the day uh, where we meet the voters. Uh, so I think, uh, and of course, there you must also add, there is, they are, you, must, you can't discuss this without uh, explaining the differences between the proportional system and the first pass at the post system. <coughs> we can go to, we have, well, one constituency is the same as one county. You have 15 seats from, from one county. We can, we don't compete in the boxing ring with the moderates. We can have one, they can have two, well, so we, they are not that kind of infighting. So I believe that is easier for us to form a, an alliance before the election, mm -hmm. of course. But, and we have tried, yeah, the question about, uh, the, question about uh, <coughs> formation, the formation of alliances before. Well, as I tried to mention, we have had a system where the Social Democrats has been, uh, ha had, have had total hegemony in Sweden, almost. And we, on the center-right side, some years we tried to fight for being the closest ally in Parliament to the Social Democrats. The Centre Party has definitely been, definitely been one of them who had been the closest ally to the Social Democrats, where the Liberals have been there as well. But always it ended up with the Social Democratic government. We are, have not, the only way for us to win the election was to cooperate and to present to the, Due to our history, the, f the, f the failures of the centre-right, the few governments that we have had in the previous time, we really need to be... <coughs> the, the voters need to be so convinced that we were fit to govern. And that was the common understanding of all the four party leaders. We must do... We had to be pragmatic, we had to compromise, because we need to show how strong we, how good we are on cooperating together. And we have turned this, the, the, the ability to govern uh, has turned from a strength for the Social Democrats to a strength, strength for the Alliance. Uh, so we are proven able to govern, mm -hmm. which was really important. Thanks. Um, Stephanie, do you want to say just, something? Just, I mean, the, just, no, might, just very briefly to the question the about the yeah. formation of, mm. the, of the government. In, in Germany, it actually, it's a very easy answer, theoretically. It's uh, traditionally always the conservatives with the liberals, which, by the way, <laughs> the liberals are quite different from the Lib Dems here in this country, of course. Um, and the Social Democrats with the Green Party. So it's uh, center-left, center-right, so to say. But then again, of course, reality hits and things become much more difficult and then it's about Jamaica coalition with green, yellow, black, or it could be the, oh well, all kinds of colors then in the end are discussed, but um, yeah, it's, it, there's a traditional, always, almost a tradition which coalition they will promote and they will go, of course they go in and say, Merkel could not have said, um, I want a grand coalition, of course she can't, because that would mean that the coalition she was just leading didn't work. And um, on the fixed-term parliament point, I was going to ask you, because I know um, back in 2005, yeah. um, that's another one of the 50 ways, I think, yeah. uh, Gerhard Schroeder, um, even though you have a fixed-term parliament, quite strong provisions, but he, as I understand, sort of engineered a vote of no confidence in his own government. Yeah, but it wasn't about the coalition. No, that's it the was point. It was early party. elections because it was actually about the um, Hartz IV reforms, the complete reform and overturn of the labor market and yeah. the social security system. And because they lost in Nordrhein-Westfalen, which is the most important land in Germany, mm. then Schröder suddenly, because he was such a political animal, he just came out and said, okay, new elections. I want a mandate for what I'm doing. Mm. And it was about divisions within his own party over... Of course, it, it was as yeah. well, but it was mainly he wanted a mandate for this historic reforms he's mm. been doing, he's, he's done. Okay, yeah. Because, I mean, <coughs> theoretically, David yeah. Cameron could, under our fixed-term parliament act, yeah. use a similar kind of tactic. Do you, can you see that as a possibility from your observations? Well, it might be clever. I don't know. But, um, in, of course, in Germany, it was a complete shock. I mean, you would do four years, and you do four years, and suddenly he comes out and says, no, we do new elections. Hmm. 
I remember it was a shock to everybody mm. then. Okay, interesting. Um, okay, yeah, no, we're going to pick up. Yeah. Fixed term. We, we don't mm. have fixed term in Ireland, but uh, in 2002, or in 1997 rather, um, following the election, the Taoiseach at that time, the Prime Minister, announced that this government was going to go for full five years. Mm. Nobody believed him. The opposition geared up the usual time about a year before the election was due to uh, blew all their policies and everything else. It went the full term. He, he was returned. He did the same thing in 2002, returned again. 2007, returned again, saying we're going to have a five-year term. Mm. Um, so I, I don't think it matters whether you have a fixed term or not. It's what you do when you're actually in government for the, for the term that counts. And in relation to Dick's question, just a, about um, stating which party you're going to go with or anything else, the answer an Irish politician will give you to that question during an election campaign is we are fighting this election on our own platform, we want to maximise our own votes and um, we're not tying ourselves to anybody until we see what the, what the people decide and they look at it at that stage. Ironically enough, the Labour Party in the, I think it was the 2002 election, had a pact with one of the larger parties, lost out in that election 2007. They had no pact, refused to do it, but, and they lost out in that election as well. You know, They would usually be the minority uh, party in coalitions in Ireland. Um, so that's, that's really the way they answer. Nobody commits themselves beforehand uh, or even during an election campaign as to who their coalition partner would be. Mm. There is also this question, sorry, just before I bring you in, Stan, about um, the larger parties um, saying in public anyway, you know, coalitions or implying that it's an aberration and, you know, they're still pushing, of course, to win a majority. I mean, you talked about how you went through your own kind of learning yeah. experience about this, but was there a period when Fianna Foyle continued to kind of right. aspire and hope to win to Right, win right up to... Um, well, recent times, mm. um, but nobody would believe you anymore if you said that you, you were going for single party government. We nearly did it in 2002, mm. in fact, but uh, everybody now expects that there's going to have to be negotiations post elections and that there's going to be compromises, which causes a problem for politics generally, because even if you go out on a particular platform that you really genuinely, sincerely believe in and everything else, and you don't get a majority, then you co start compromising and you immediately start losing when you start compromising. Um, and it, that does cause its own difficulties. Mm, I'm sure. Um, Stan, yeah, do, do you want yeah, to I, I think there's actually one common answer to all the, the, the underlying common answer to all the questions you just uh, asked, and that's that basically the politicians, they behave according to the system you have in your country. Uh, the system in Sweden with fixed terms, fixed terms with uh, 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 right-wing parties who really have a, uh, the, uh, they're really obsessed by social democratics being so long uh, in power, makes them, there's enough uh, centrifugal powers to, to get them together. Uh, in uh, the, the electoral system in uh, Britain will make a coalition highly unlikely. I mean, the thing that it has been the last time, it was for the first time in, uh, well, 30, 40 years, uh, I think, that there was a hung parliament. Uh, but then in our country, in my country, where one single vote can give a political party an extra seat or not, they would, political parties in my country would be very unwise to say before, before the election with whom they would participate, uh, would try to make a coalition, because uh, if the Labour Party says, well, we're going to only with left-wing parties, then their right wing, they won't vote Labour anymore. And if Labour says, well, we're going to do a coalition for the middle, then the left wing uh, of the Labour Party falls. So they don't say anything because they want to keep as many votes as possible. It's just politicians are not difficult people. They really are, uh, are, are, are working the way the system asks them to do in the most effective way. So that's why I think a, a coalition in, uh, in, in, in Britain will be very unlikely. Um, Yeah, well, that's it. Sorry. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, please. Maybe I, uh, I will follow up on that, John, because I'm, I'm not 
I disagree a little bit with, with Stan. I believe that coalitions is here to stay uh, in almost every country. Uh, it's inter uh, there is even a w there is a no expression in Swedish for the term of hung parliament, because oh, every parliament is a hung parliament. So you don't need a <laughs> need an expression for that one. Uh, and and uh, well, this discussion about the formation of the alliance has led to as I told uh, you, uh, that the Social Democrats, they are forced to give an answer to the who, who, with whom they will uh, govern if they mm. will have more votes than the Alliance. And they try to answer that in different ways. Uh, they try to split the Alliance, inv inviting us to, to join or, or to, yeah, have an open question. But they have, they have for the second uh, election in a row, they have told the voters that they will not be able to, to govern for themselves next time, which is mm -hmm. historical. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it is indeed an international trend that there's growing pluralism and decline of dominant parties in, in many countries, um, but not to say majority government won't return potentially here next time. Um, okay, time for some more questions. Uh, Yes, okay, there's quite a few. So we'll start here at the front and then go to Jill and then the gentleman behind. Um, John Gievex of Whitehall. Uh, two questions. One, in the British context, the obvious way for the coalition to break up before uh, the due date is for the Liberals to leave and for the Conservatives then to govern as a minority. And they must be furiously wondering whether that will tell to their advantage or disadvantage. So I'd like some views from the panel on how that would likely play out. And I can't <coughs> forbear from asking um, how on earth in Holland the civil service has sustained a cross-party support for its highly politically determining role hmm. in elections. Hmm. Okay, that's gonna be definitely one for you, Stan. Uh, Jill. Okay, well, my, uh, my comment is going to follow on a bit from John's comment there. I'm Jill Rutter, I'm Institute for Government, also ex Whitehall. I noticed the other panel members sort of slightly get taken aback by Stan's description of the role of the civil service in helping the other parties or helping government prepare for the next election. So I just wondered if, uh, very quickly, the other panelists could explain what the civil service and their systems do, in a sense, to make sure that the policies coming forward uh, are ready to be take their place in a coalition uh, treaty or whatever. I mean, reading the German one, it's Im immensely and horrendously detailed. I thought the Koalitionsvertrag that came out yesterday, it just looked extraordinarily detailed to us. Uh, so what's the role of the civil service in that sort of end phase when there's not that much governing going on? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, yes, gentlemen, just here in the Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Justin Russell from the Department for Work and Pensions. I'm intrigued by the choreography of the very last months of a coalition government. Um, do, do, the, do the government continue to act as a government literally right up to the day an election is called, or is there a sort of formal splitting apart several months uh, ahead? How, wh at what point do the gloves come off between coalition partners in advance of an actual general election start date and in the British context you know the party conferences in the autumn of next year would would be the obvious starting gun for all of the parties to, to launch their you know lo long run election campaigns but they'd still you know we'd still have eight or nine months to go before the actual election so what what happens in that in that period mm -hmm. okay thanks um, so yeah interesting set of questions so what about this option of one party leaving and the larger party governing as a minority. Not sure if any of you have experience of, of, of that happening, but how might that play out? Uh, Stan, how did you come to take over the country? <laughs> 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 and um, then for the rest of the panel... Just do things more yeah. openly in the Netherlands, well, the civil service do it anyway. Yeah, well, interesting <laughs> to hear then how the other civil service in the other countries support policy development across all parties, and then finally this question about how the last few months work. So uh, let's start with you, Sam, this time. Well, I would definitely, to start with the first question, I would definitely advise the Liberals not to leave the government uh, just a few months before the election. It would, it would just give 
to in, in our if they would do it in our country they would get thrashed by the electorate because they expect a political party to be sensible and to uh, to take if they are in government then stick to it even though you don't like it so I'm, I can't make it more clearly to you, I'm afraid, than that. Uh, how does the Dutch civil service uh, rules a country? Um, well, um, we, we don't have any political appointees in the Netherlands. So if a new, mini if a new cabinet comes in, the, each, each minister gets one political assistant to have contact with parliament, but for the rest they take the civil servants who are there. Uh, for, to me, it's always a horror story to hear that whenever there is a political uh, a new prime minister in Britain, he takes in 250 people in Downing Street, and the first thing they start fighting. I'm not sure is that quite. Is that it, isn't that much? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> At least uh, when I talk to to people from the policy unit or uh, the, the um, uh, in, uh, at number 10. I always get the impression, I, I've had uh, talks with Chris Murrin uh, when I was here last year, and they, they gave me the impression that then it's really difficult for a new prime minister to enforce his ideas, enforce or to implement his ideas, because um, there is always a fight going on, well, uh, uh, not, a, not a real fight of course, but you know what I mean, between the center of government and the different departments. If I'm talking total nonsense here, if no one understands what I'm meaning, it is true, uh, luckily. There is someone here saying, I won't ask which department you're from. Um, we, don't, we don't have that, but it, it's actually, it's also a responsibility because if we are very lucky in the Netherlands, the civil servants, to still have the trust of our politicians. For some reason, they still believe uh, what we say, and I'm, I'm very happy with that. Um, but it also takes, gives us the responsibility to accept that pol politics do a different job than civil servants. So we, we need to help them, uh, and I, th I think we need to help them doing their job. So that's why we are very, uh, we never have any political judgment, but we try to give them as much information to, for them to take as good decisions as possible. But that's really, it, 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 you understand what I mean, I see? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's why we do this election manifesto uh, engineering uh, calculations. We do this, we deliver them all their uh, um, uh, cutback possibilities, tax raise possibilities. But we, you also have to do it in a, in a um, apolitical way. So we try to think for cutbacks for the, 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 the moderates, the, the, the right wing people, but also for the social democrats. It's actually, yeah. I, I just brought with you, this is, this is the calculations of all the election <laughs> manifestos uh, before the, which is published by the Central uh, uh, Planning Agency. <laughs> and then they really compare all the, the civil service. It's actually very easy because afterwards when they do the negotiations, you already know what kind of policy uh, um, uh, statements they're gonna make and, and actually what the treasury think it will uh, give in money or whatever. So it it's, it's also makes it easy to, uh, to draw up a coalition agreement. Yeah, I would, I, I am, but I, of course I'm grown up into this system, so I like it very much, but um, I, I don't know if it would work in a, in a highly political, politicized uh, world here in, uh, here in Britain. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no, please. Um, again, I'd, I'd echo what Stan says about leaving government um, unless there's a very, very good reason, and the only really good reason is if somebody says, you know, this commitment we've made in the program for government, we're reneging on it. The other party says something along those lines. Um, if, you, if you leave government, uh, it'll be seen as petulance. It, it will, you will suffer for it. And I'm not saying that we'll say if the Lib Dems leave, that that'll give the Conservatives a, a clean run or anything else. In the last government that we had, the, the Greens um, in November, uh, two, two years short of a full term, they announced that they'd support the budget uh, and some fiscal measures that had to be taken but um, uh, support the finance bill, but then they would look for an election to be called, um, which effectively ended the government. The budget passed, the Troika came in, um, the election was called in February, uh, there was no green TD returned, and uh, Fianna Fáil, which would have had 35 to 40% of support since the foundation of the state in the early, uh, well, since the 1930s, ended up with 16% of the vote. Both parties were wiped out uh, in, the, in the election uh, campaign. Now, part of that, I have to say, w w was because of the, the economic tsunami that we had, but some of it also. We, 
a uh, couple of the other coalitions that we talked about that broke up in, um, in disharmony that Fianna Fáil were involved in. Fianna Fáil lost seats. Um, the smaller party actually won seats in one of the elections, but in the other one, and we lost, but in the other one, both parties again. Where it's the acrimony, where there's acrimony, where it breaks up like that, uh, in, inevitably the parties in government will suffer because the opposition can say, look at these people can't get on, they can't, you know, it's, um, so. Mm -hmm. I'm actually fascinated by, by what uh, Stan said. We, we have the total opposite in Ireland, really, in, 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 in many respects. Uh, civil servants, the minute an election comes, civil servants take one step back from the political system completely. And, uh, you know, right, you'll get, you, you'll get back up, but it, it, it's all scrutinized to make sure that it is you know, this is ministerial business you're doing, that you're not going off to do a canvas or whatever else. Now you'll do official openings or whatever else you have to do in your diary and so on, and you'll get back up for that. But anything at all that smacks of anything to do with the politics or the election campaign, it's a no-no as far as civil servants are concerned, irrespective of what party is in power or anything else. And the negotiations for the program for government don't involve civil servants at all. Um, I negotiated five or six of the, the programs for government with two other government colleagues uh, or two other party colleagues and the opposition. Where the civil servants will help is a, a little bit like Stan's scenario is, um, and it was often used, I'd have to say, by my party who was in government most of the time negotiating <laughs> the thing, uh, when you were getting a particular set of policies that you really didn't think were feasible, you'd say, well, well, we'll send these to the Department of Finance and we'll get them to cost them and so on, and we'll make a decision then. Uh, and that, that worked, but the, the other, the smaller party could go to the Department of Finance as well uh, and make sure that we weren't pulling a fast one, if you like. The Department of Finance as well will, um, have a look at party manifestos prior to an election and they'll see if the sums add up and they will say to the party, well, the sums add up now, but they won't make any comment on the quality of the, the things or whether we have the money to do it or uh, you know, whether it's mad or anything else. <laughs> they'll just say the sums add up, like if you're spending this amount, you have provided for it in, in, in uh, income. but. Um, it's parties like to be able to say we went to the Department of Finance and they said nothing with it. I think the Department of Finance are getting a bit fed up about it mm. because they're being used as an endorsement for party um, party policy platforms um, when they don't really uh, agree with the policies that are in it. But I, I'm actually I'm, I'm fascinated by the way they do it in the Netherlands. I think it'd be a great system politicians everywhere, but particularly in Ireland, they never like telling people the cold hard facts of, of things, but they're not bad actually if somebody can spell the thing out and you know give it out in black and white, then they they will say, well we can't do we can't once there's somebody else to blame, I suppose is the easiest way of putting this, once there's somebody else to blame, well we can't do that because uh, I, I think it'll work. It it could work very, very well. No, Fianna Fáil. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, and uh, yeah, Stephanie, please. Brief, because it's sure, yeah, 7.30, we are but um, the your, I think I don't have to um, repeat the answer to, to your question. I also said it in, in my little presentation. Um, Jill's question about uh, the poor civil servants. Um, this, yeah, in fact, it is, I think the coalition agreement is 188 pages, and so it goes really into details about everything, and the nice thing is that after the mandate after the term, you can look at to every point and you can say that it, this, they didn't do this, they didn't do this, so that's also for the press a very nice thing. But um, <laughs> talking about the bitter job of civil servants, um, I, before I came to London I was based four years in Brussels and I could witness like how much um, the civil servants can get paralyzed by a coalition and this was for example the case um, with the directive for energy, directive for energy efficiency which was highly controversial in the coalition because the liberals who have the 
who had the uh, Ministry for Economy didn't want all this efficiency stuff because it's very expensive for the industry. And the CDU, which in the Environment Ministry have very hardline uh, pro-environment people, they wanted this um, directive and nothing happened for, I don't know, two or three years. I mean, probably the civil servants in other countries were very thankful because they didn't have to work. Um, but that, so these co coalitions, if they have like a counter, counterweight in different ministries, it can really become a disaster when you tr have to have a policy which, um, which, which has links into different departments. Um, and the last thing about how long civil servants have to work or if they can go and have a coffee uh, six months before an election. But in, in Germany, because they, the last co uh, coalition was such a disaster, they in the very end, in the run up to the, co um, to the elections, try to bring a lot of things through actually. And so um, just to create a last positive impression. And so the civil servants, I think they had a lot of work in the end. <laughs> Okay, and final word, yeah. Magnus. Yeah, and uh, to start with, uh, I think the German government need a policy coordination secretariat. <laughs> then she could solve these mm. problems, or try to solve them at least. Uh, coming to um, this about uh, leaving a coalition uh, early, well, I'm afraid I would not be in a position that I could advise, but if it had been in Sweden, uh, you, have been, you should have been punished uh, quite severely if you jump off uh, a coalition uh, before the fixed period ends. We had one example in the early 80s uh, when the Moderaterna, the, uh, well, Tories, uh, left uh, the, the government uh, in, in, and, and tried to gain, and, and, and then they gained from it uh, because they turned into, in a way, uh, true right flank uh, ideological uh, they could be stronger there. So they, they actually gain from leaving the center-right government, but that is, I think, the exception. When it comes to the uh, civil service, you can say that um, we have uh, 4,000 civil servants in Sweden, 200 political uh, employed people, including the ministers. Um, and uh, we are, they are, we are, we have a budget period as, uh, so we are in full time operating, working with the budget for 2015. And then of course, we, the, the, the government, as the government are preparing the, the budget bill uh, and they are working with the budget bill. But there is a delicate balance between preparing the, the, the budget bill for 2015 and what is more like uh, the political party thing. So. So there is an ongoing discussion and we meet uh, civil service saying that is this part of the budget or is it part of something else? Uh, you have to have that balance. And of course it's, it's quite hard to, to see them um, preparing for a shift. They of course reading the manifestos for the opposition, they reading their budget uh, proposals in able to, to, to prepare if there will be a shift in, in September. So, um, but that's, that's their role. But as, as long as it's connected to the budget or connected to, uh, with uh, ordinary ministerial work, of course they still work with the government. Um, just ending with, with the discussion about uh, the last phase of the, before the election. We, as, well, we have election in September, the Alliance present our the common manifesto is launched by the end of August and the party manifestos are launched in the beginning of August. So in a way we have first appeared where the, the parties can uh, raise specific issues, then it, it's all moving towards the common manifesto and then oh, we are working with that one. Uh, but as we have told the voters, we are going to uh, seek support for a third term, uh, then of course we not do that much of infighting. Mm. Okay, thank you. Well, um, apologies to those who didn't get to ask a question, but please do join us for a drink on the landing and continue the conversation there. And uh, finally, please just uh, join me in thanking the panel for excellent discussion. <laughs>